All right, I am here with Sean Savage, founder and CEO of GoShare. They're a company that helps businesses uh, efficiently deliver big and bulky goods. How are you doing today, Sean? I'm good. Thanks, Eric. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm happy to, to have a, um, a, CEO, a San Diego uh, founder and CEO on the show today. I don't get as many as I'd like, um, so it's going to be really fun talking about a, somebody who's been in the, the startup ecosystem with me for many years. Um, we're going to talk about your, your rise to fame, but, uh, I'd love to just kind of kick it off and, and learn a bit about you and your journey and, and ultimately what made you found the company. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate you helping to tell our story and, um, I, yeah, the journey, uh, it, you know, it started a long time ago, I guess, but, um, you know, there was a couple of, I guess, pivotal moments in, in my life that kind of led me ultimately to, to start GoShare. I'd say one of the first ones that I can think of is, you know, back when I was in college at uh, the University of Delaware, I uh, ran a house painting business for for a year, and uh, we were just you know painting houses in New Jersey. Um, I hired a couple of couple of buddies mostly and uh, younger guys to uh, to to join me. We maybe had about seven or eight people on the team, and one of the biggest challenges that I had at the time was getting, um, you know, paint and other materials delivered to job sites. Mm. And so it ended up being me almost every day, you know, six o'clock in the morning, getting up, going to Sherwin Williams, getting paint mixed, and then delivering it to various job sites around New Jersey. And if, um, you know, if we needed more supplies, more paint or, you know, more equipment, um, it was usually me that would have to leave the job site, go get that, that, that supply uh, mm. refilled. And whenever I would do that, our team was significantly less productive than they were when I was on the site. And, yeah. um, and, I, and I remember wishing at the time that Sherwin-Williams would deliver paint to us so, I, so we didn't have to send somebody back to the store. And um, kind of a cool story, but now we deliver paint for Sherwin-Williams across the country. So <laughs> um, it's kind of all came so full circle. They still don't want to do it. <laughs> Well, they, they, I don't, I think they want to offer it, but no, they don't want to do it themselves. Although that's, yeah. that's not necessarily fair because they, they do some deliveries themselves. They have their own small fleet of vans that, that they use, but GoShare essentially supplements and their fleet, uh, especially during the peak season, um, you know, during the summer and springtime when uh, they might not have enough capacity to do all the deliveries on their own. Hmm. Interesting. So that, that's actually the first uh, the first lesson that I, I want to share with our audience here. Something that that comes up this problem into a very successful business. But too many startup founders that I've I've worked with over the years um, feel the need to kind of pitch in and do the the grunt work, right? Because they want to, um, you know, they 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 want to help out their team. They want to make their team uh, more comfortable or or sort of get them out of the way of having to do the grunt work. And so they end up stepping down into that kind of low level uh, role in order to kind of keep things going, but it's really an inefficient use of the founder's time. Um, and I see it happen all the time. So, so the way the, the first kind of lesson that I would talk about is founders need to think about the value of the work that they're doing and are they stepping up in value or stepping down in value? So um, mm -hmm. when you think about, you know, the shit rolling downhill, so to speak, uh, if there's nobody to do a task, if there's nobody in your company who can do a role and that work is falling down into your lap, falling into your lap, cause there's nobody else to take it. That's a signal that this is low value work that needs to be, um, delegated or, or hired for what you want is the value is that work to be escalated to you, right? Teams doing something, they're working hard, but they can't figure something out. It has to be escalated. It has to be lifted up to, to your level. Um, and that's sort of just one, um, you know, paradigm or, or mindset shift that I do a lot with my clients is thinking about the value of the work. And is it falling in your lap or is it being escalated? If it's falling in your lap, that's, that's a ripe target for us to, uh, to try to delegate or automate, uh, or I guess, start an entire company to <laughs> to fix that problem. Yeah, it's a it's a good point and you know, honestly through the years I've 
caught myself falling into that trap, you know, mm -hmm. quite a few times. It's, it's, I think, kind of natural. And also, I think a lot of founders just want to, they want to help in any way they can. And so if mm -hmm. they see a task that is not getting done or not getting done fast enough, they'll step in and maybe do that lower level task, even mm -hmm. if it's not the best use of their time. And, you know, I've, I have to make a conscious effort sometimes to say, okay, this needs to be delegated. And uh, even recently, some of our um, you know, board members told me like, you should be delegating almost everything mm -hmm. that you can to someone else on the team. And yeah, if there's no one on the team that could do it, and it's a recurring need, then yes, that's usually a good sign that you need to fill that role and, and hire someone for it. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of founders uh, probably do get get caught up in those kind of low value tasks, either out of necessity or just out of like a desire to move fast and just get things done as quickly as possible. And it's, yeah. it, it is a good reminder that delegating is one of the most important roles that a CEO has in a company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, it's one of these things, right? There's, there's of course some nuance here and, and I'm sure some of our listeners would would argue that you know a CEO, nothing your CEO shouldn't be above doing any work to to keep the company moving, but if you're seeing any kind of a pattern, um, you know it's something that keeps recurring, well, that's obviously an opportunity to to hire or fill that role. Um, and also too is that if if as a CEO I'm I'm stepping down and doing some lower value work, I'm modeling that behavior, right? I'm doing it because I'm trying to coach or train somebody or create some kind of playbook so that I can then delegate. And as the company scales and grows, there's always new frontiers of, of chaotic work that has to be done. But as leaders, we should be constantly thinking about, all right, if I have to step down into this, into this role, I'm going to do it once and for all, all, right? And I'm doing it for the purpose of creating a playbook that can, that can be delegated out. Um, but Sorry for a little tangent there, but I always love kind of taking these little principles and, and making it a teaching moment. Um, but so yeah, you, you found point. this opportunity and you started this business, um, but this is, there's a, a large sort of marketplace or, or tech platform here as well, right? Uh, yeah, there is. And, you know, we built, um, you know, we, we started by building mobile apps. That was kind of like our first kind of foray into this, you know, back in 2015, we, we wanted to build an app that made it really simple for, you know, a truck or a van owner to connect directly with either a business or a person that needed mm -hmm. a truck or a van, whether it was delivering something from a store or whether it was moving to a new apartment. Um, you know, we just wanted to make the process like really simple and, and easy. And so I, you know, after, you know, a couple, couple of years of serving tens of thousands of customers and, you know, getting some traction, you know, from, from the marketplace, we, we kind of started understanding from talking to our business customers, mainly large retailers, that there was a really big opportunity for us in the retail space, because mm -hmm. most of these large retailers were outsourcing their deliveries to third parties. But these third parties weren't technology companies like GoShare, they were essentially small, mom and pop type of delivery businesses, or they maybe had one van or one truck or two trucks. And, you know, they were trying to do as many deliveries as they can in a very small geographic area. And that led to uh, really bad experiences for mm -hmm. the customers of those retailers. So the delivery windows were one to two weeks, and you had to sit at home for eight hours and wait for someone to show up. And a lot of it was done either via phone call or email or, you know, some you know old fashioned model of, of, uh, of scheduling. And the, there wasn't a lot of accountability. And so if, if, if a delivery was late or damaged or anything like that, there was, you know, there wasn't really anyone to talk to about it. And so I think GoShare kind of recognized that there was a really big opportunity here to offer this kind of last mile delivery solution to large enterprise retailers who have a, a national footprint so that they can get a so that they can offer their customers a better overall experience lower cost more convenience um and that's kind of where we've been focused on uh, for the last couple of years so you know in addition to building out the mobile apps and the website to, to make this possible we we also um we also released our api 
about two years ago that allows our customers to integrate GoShare directly into their either point of sale system or transportation management system to make the process even more seamless uh, for for the business user. So instead of having to go to our app or our website, they could do it. From, they can order GoShare from within their own system. Uh, and this is especially important for like the high volume shippers that you know maybe you know need to use GoShare hundreds of times per per day or per week. Now, are you still doing the the peer to peer connection, or do you have your own fleet now that you're providing to these enterprises? It's it's still like a peer to peer model. So yeah. we, GoShare is is an asset light business. So we don't we don't own any of the trucks or vans or any of the equipment. Uh, the delivery professionals um, that we contract with. Uh, essentially uh, operate as their own independent businesses. Mm -hmm. And we're, we simply provide them the tools and the, uh, the customers essentially, and the customer support uh, to make their, to make it easier for them to run their own delivery business. Hmm. So how did you, how did you solve that problem of, you know, if you have trucks on your platform that want to offer services to a big retailer, how do you control for that? Like you said, the, you know, the long windows or the, the lack of service? I mean, is that somehow built into the platform? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we, you know, we use technology like artificial intelligence and machine learning to, to make the process very efficient for everybody. So mm -hmm. um, instead of having to, you know, call someone or, you know, you know, wait, you know, have someone uh, schedule a, you know, eight hour time window for you, you know, a week or two out, you simply tell us when you want the item delivered and we're able to deliver it at that time. And so. Oh, so you can look across like all these different available uh, service providers and see who can, who can provide that service. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so part, part of the, the technology that we built is about, is about the matching process, right? So mm -hmm. it's about, a uh, customer says, hey, I need to have a, uh, a couch, you know, delivered in Los Angeles um, today at three o'clock. You know, our system is able to pinpoint which of the 25,000 plus contractors in our system would be a good fit for that role based on their location, uh, based on their equipment, their availability, things like that. We send them the the basically the request from the customer it says hey we have a customer near you that has a that has a delivery and you know are you able to do it yes or no and the the drivers have the ability to essentially accept or reject you know any request that we send them um, but because the matching technology is really good we're usually we usually end up finding uh, a match within you know a minute um, and so then the customer is it a, an uber model is there some is that is that a good uh, analogy or is there is it different it's a fair analogy. Yeah, it's a very similar business model to Uber or Lyft uh, in that, you know, we're connecting the driver to the customer directly and seamlessly. And um, yeah, the the drivers are uh, independent contractors or small business owners. Mm -hmm. uh, they provide their, their own equipment, their own vehicles, and they kind of, they have the ability to work when they want. Um, they can, you know, they can accept any or, or reject any request that comes in. And you know, if they want to take a vacation, they want to take a couple of days off, they don't need to call us or let us know. They just turn their app off and, you know, we won't bother them. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why we've been able to attract uh, a very broad audience of what we call delivery professionals is because we give them the the flexibility to work when they want and, you know, get paid uh, quickly uh, without having to use a factoring company, which are which is pretty common in the, the mm -hmm. trucking space. And um we provide them with all the tools that they need to essentially get the job done without having to really think about too much else other than getting the object from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, oh, that's really cool. I always love when, you know, anything that helps the little guy, right? So somebody, they know, mm -hmm. they now don't have to worry about marketing and, you know, all that trying to get customers. They can just hop on your platform and, and get the deal. That's great. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They don't have to worry about marketing. They don't have to worry about collecting cash or payments. Hmm. Um, that that's a that was a big sticking point. I mean, imagine how awkward it is, you know, when you provide a service for somebody, and then at the end you're like, okay, like how about the money? And then they, you know, try to negotiate with you, or they're like, oh, I only, you know, I don't have any cash on me. I got to go to the bank or this and that. And 
I mean, that was actually a big problem, I think, for a lot of these delivery professionals historically, because before GoShare, they were getting their work either, you know, using something like Craigslist, or maybe they were even like sitting at a Home Depot or a Lowe's, like, you know, waiting for someone to kind of come out and, and, and need their services. And so I think we've been able to kind of organize the chaos and provide them with, yeah, the marketing support, the payment support, also the customer service, you know, so if anything goes wrong, the driver and the customer both have GoShare's customer support team to count on to help resolve you know, any disputes that kind of pop up along the way. So I think uh, for all, all of those reasons, I think the, the drivers really uh, appreciate um, you know, the, the services that GoShare and, and, the, and our app are able to provide them. Yeah, oh, that's incredible. So I'm, I'm, you mentioned the chaos. I'm interested, what were some of your growing pains or the things that you were struggling as you were growing up? Well, uh, there was there was plenty of growing pains along the way. <laughs> um, how much time do you have? So, uh, <laughs> so I would say like you can always edit it. <clears throat> <so. laughs> yeah, I, you know, I would say like in the early the earliest days, the growing pains. I think a lot of it were, was related to uh, trust and lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And so, like for example, I remember, you know, one of the first customers that like ever used our app to order without like we didn't know this person. It was just a totally random person. They found the app, they placed an order, and we delivered, you know, a mattress for, for them. And I, I remember calling the lady and just to say thank you, like, hey, you know, saw you place an order. I saw the drivers on the way. Thank you so much. Like, how'd you hear about us? Just asking some general questions. And her reaction was really eye-opening for me. She was like, oh, I'm so happy that you called. And I was like, oh, why, why is that? And she she said, uh, well, because your, your driver just came and picked up the mattress and, uh, I honestly thought there was like at least a 50% chance that I was never going to see that mattress again. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? You know, like why, why would you not see it again? And she's like, well, I don't know what GoShare is. I don't know who you are. There's no reviews about you online. You're a brand new company. We literally just, just launched like that week. And she's like, the only reason I use it is because it's late at night and nobody else is open. And so like, you're the only ones that would, that would do it for me. But I, was really concerned that this person was going to potentially steal my mattress. And I, I remember at the time it was like, wow, like I know that we're trustworthy, trustworthy and we're not going to do, do anything like that, but no one else knows that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'd say like one of the early growing pains for a marketplace is, is, uh, is trust is establishing, you know, that you're a reputable company and you can't just buy that. Right. You have to, you have to earn it over time and it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it takes, you know, several customers using it and writing a good review or, or telling their friends or whatever it is before you develop that reputation where people can trust you without, you know, questioning whether or not you're going to deliver what you promise. And so yeah. I would say like that was uh, definitely one of the early, early growing pains. And then I think the growing pains kind of evolve as you, as the company matures mm -hmm. and uh, at, at different stages of the company, there's different growing pains. Like, you know, you, in the early days, you also need, you need funding, right? Like you need money from investors and that's, you know, not always easy to come by, uh, especially if you're a first time founder. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't really have a reputation. You, no one knows if you're going to do well or not. And so you have to, you have to convince investors to give you money, sometimes mil millions of dollars. And I think that that, that is uh, that's definitely a challenge that a lot of startups face. And I think that's probably amplified today because the, the market today for venture capital is quite different than it was when we started mm -hmm. uh, eight years ago. It's probably a little bit harder to get funding, I would think, today than it was a couple years ago. And, well, and then, you know, well, go let, ahead. Let, let's pause there for a moment because I think that's a really great theme here around trust building, both with, with customers, with the market and with, with investors as well. So um, what would be you know, your sort of principles or lessons learned or things that you would impart um, or even what you've systematized into your culture, um, first off, you know, focusing on how do we build trust and reputation um, in mm -hmm. the market? I would say like probably the core principle that, that I've always tried to follow, and I learned this when I had my house painting business uh, when I was in college, is you can never over promise and under deliver. It's one of the biggest mistakes mm -hmm. that you can make. And I think that's true if you're for customers, for investors, for anyone else. If you are making promises that you know you can't achieve, you're setting yourself up for failure. Like there's no way to overcome that. 
And so that was one of the lessons I think that I tried to instill upon everyone in the company and, and practice myself is that, you know, we're not going to make a promise to somebody that we know we can't keep. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, if you start off with that kind of basic principle, um, you're, you're setting yourself up for, for success and trust building over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause then if you, if you either, if you meet it, you're great. If you exceed it, now you've delighted them. Right. Yeah, that's right. But it, but if you if you fail to hit that, then you you've already lost that customer. You've you've lost trust. You've you've kind of broken broken the relationship a little bit. And so, yeah. um, I think that's probably one of the most important things that that companies can do. And then, yep, the other thing, which is a little bit more, I guess, tactical, is I think online reviews are very important. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're a consumer or whether you're a business searching for a product or service, I think today most people and, and you could you could probably vouch for this yourself as a as a person and someone who consumes things <laughs> whether it's a whether it's a restaurant or a new iphone or a service like mm -hmm. a delivery service a moving service it doesn't matter before you book or buy you're probably going to read some reviews about the company or the product before you do mm -hmm. it and so we we found that it's really important to collect online reviews from customers who have had a good experience um, to help build up your, your online reputation. And then reputation management as an ongoing um, strategy is, is really important too. So, um, you know, t I could, and today, like Gosha has a very good reputation online. Like if you look at, at the app store, our iPhone app has over 10,000 five-star reviews. And so for any new person looking at that, they're like, okay, this is a reputable company. Like lots of people have vouched for them, but uh, we didn't have that in, in the early, in the early days we had no, we had no reviews. And so we had a, we had to make a, an effort to collect them over time and make sure that we were getting feedback from our customers. And each time you get a new review, a new testimonial, um, you know, it helps you get the next customer. Absolutely. So what do you do in the cases where, whether by accident or oversight, you do make a mistake, you do under deliver or mm -hmm. screw up somehow? How do you control for that? Uh, you, you apologize quickly and uh, yeah. emphatically, I think is what uh, Dale Carnegie says. Yeah, because um, yeah, yeah, of course we make mistakes. I mean, we're not, we're not always perfect. Um, and so, yeah, when you make a mistake, you just kind of, you own up to it. You say, we're sorry, we made a mistake. We'd like to make it up for you. Sometimes we'll offer them a discount, um, you know, on, on a future a future delivery or 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 the or the one that was messed up, depending on what the the circumstances were. Um, but uh, I could think of one example where during COVID, uh, a customer, I think he was up in the Bay Area, called, and this was on one of those days where uh, we I was taking customer service calls because every couple of months, I like to, to do that just to kind of stay sharp and, and see what customers are saying. So I was like taking customer service calls and a guy called and he was irate. I think he was very mad that the driver at the time wasn't wearing a mask. And this was like kind of during, you know, 2020 COVID period when generally we, we were, you know, advising drivers to wear a mask whenever they were doing a delivery and were in contact with people. And the, per the guy called, he was screaming at me. He was like, I can't believe your driver wasn't wearing a mask. What if I get COVID? What if my wife gets COVID? What if my kid gets COVID? I'm, I, and he was understandably angry. And I think after letting him scream at me for five or 10 minutes, I said, so, you know, what, what do you want? Like, what, what can we do to make this right? He's like, I want a 20% 20, 20 discount. Or, you know, I think I can't remember what the number was. He's like, I want a discount on this order. I said, okay, no problem. Gave him the discount. And he was like, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm satisfied. And, yeah. and he was happy. And that was it, you know? Yeah. And, and so, like, I mean, it, it does, maybe it doesn't always end up with such a, you know, seamless resolution. But in, the, in this particular case, he was mad. He had a legitimate reason to be mad. We mm -hmm. gave him a discount and he was happy again. And, uh, and, he, and he was a repeat customer after that. Yeah. So that's great. So, so that actually brings up two points that, um, that I've gone through a lot in my career. One is, is the value of customer service and of making things right. So I found a study, um, this was many years ago, so I can't remember all the numbers exactly, but there was a study that they did on Yelp reviews where they scraped all of the different, the sentiment from all the Yelp reviews. And what they found was the, 
maybe the majority or a very significant number of five star reviews happened when there was a mistake, when there was a problem with the orders, like restaurants, when there was a problem with the order and customer service came and made it right. They comp something, gave them a free dessert, whatever it is. And they would rave about, they said, and they would talk to the whole story. I went and they did this and they messed this up, but then they were mm -hmm. so kind and they were so generous, amazing five stars. And the majority of four star reviews is just when everything went off without a hitch. So when everything's perfectly fine, if you're having a great meal and everything just kind of happens, you actually only get four stars. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because yeah. you don't need <clears throat> somebody to come in and just really help, you know, fix things and help make you feel feel good. That happens when there's a problem and that bump people up to five stars. So I did in my companies, I would always say we have we we have to make customer service the the highest priority in the company, meaning we're not going to outsource it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to script it. Um, it really is, you know, white glove service. And so then yeah. what I do, I'm, I'm a product and engineering leader. So I'm kind of like back of the house. Um, I would do the same thing you did and have everybody on my team do a rotation on customer service once a month, once a quarter, whatever it is, um, and really let them, you know, feel that one, feel the pain that customers are dealing with but then also feel that empathy for, hey, these are, this is why we're, these people are why we're doing this. We get up every day yeah. and we write code for them and to help them. So um, it, it, it really helped create a customer centric um, mindset, especially in engineering where they tend to be really disconnected from customers and like don't really understand why are we doing this or who are we doing it for? There's no nuance to anything. Um, this was kind of like one, you know, hack that, uh, that created a whole lot more um, customer focus in in product and engineering teams. So I love to hear you doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I would just to take it one step further. Customer service has always kind of been at the forefront of, of GoShare's you know mm -hmm. philosophy of how we could be better than you know our competitors. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a quite a few things that we've done throughout the years to make sure that that remains true and. You know, one of, one of them, for example, one of the philosophies of customer service that I really like a lot uh, is the, I guess you'd call it the be our guest model. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's um, uh, it's basically Disney's customer yeah. service philosophy. And they, they wrote a great book about it called Be Our Guest. And so we've, we've given copies of that to, to our team uh, so that they can read about Disney's customer service philosophies because they are, you know, one of the best in the world uh, at customer service. And so we try to learn a lot from them. Another thing that I've done that I've, I found to be really helpful, I think for me and also for our team is I interview personally, you know, usually once a month, one of our drivers and one of our customers for like a, like a, a video, um, not, 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 not like a podcast, but more just like a YouTube video. And a, cu a couple of the key themes that come up, you know, when I talk to our drivers is that our drivers feel like we have the best customer service in the industry. And it's because we're easy, to, we're easy to get a hold of. We pick up the phone, you know, whether it's, you know, you're calling us or we're calling you. We, we have a couple of different channels that you can reach us by. So phone call, we have live chat on the website and in the app, uh, social media, of course. And we, we respond to people quickly and we, we try to solve problems as quickly as we, we possibly can. Uh, because if you don't, it's a one star review. And like you said, if you do, it's a five star review. It's yeah. there's a huge difference between focusing on customer service and building up your reputation. And there's a direct correlation between providing good service and getting better reviews and, mm -hmm. and building up your reputation online. Mm -hmm. And so when when if you if you go and look at any of these videos, whether they're from one of our drivers talking about GoShare or one of our customers, a common theme in all of them is customer service. Like they'll all, and most of them will call out specific members of our team that they've dealt with on a either one time or on a regular basis. And they're like, yeah, you know, I have a great experience with, uh, you know, with Brandy. Uh, Brandy is one of our customer service reps who, who always gets really great feedback from everybody. And uh, she gets called out by name a lot. So I'm going to call her out myself uh, <laughs> because she's done, she's just done a great job and people remember her for that. And they, they really appreciate it. And, um, you know, it goes a long way for, for getting people who, who, like you said, they maybe they had a bad experience for whatever reason, because things don't always go perfectly. And if you could take that bad experience and turn it into a positive one, 
Yeah, yeah you're gonna get you're gonna get that five star review. On the 35. <laughs>